Hey class, it's Mr. M here to introduce to you the concept of the accumulation function. Uh, this can be sometimes a complex topic uh, on its surface in calculus, but uh, I promise with a little bit of close investigation you'll find that it's actually oftentimes a lot easier than it's made out to be. So a couple of basics here to get, to get us started before we take a look at learning through an example. Uh, what is an accumulation function? It is a function, meaning an input leading to an output through a specific rule, uh, defined by an integral. So the actual rule of the function is going to make use of an integral. We're not going to apply just an integral to some function uh, and therefore get a number output, and that's called the definite integral. No, we're actually going to input a value, and then that value is going to interact with an integral to therefore produce another value. So, so it's sort of an even further step backwards in our progression here. So it's a function defined by an integral, and because it's literally defined by an integral, that tells you what kind of integral it is. It's a definite integral. One way to, to conceptualize this, and this part uh, is the part that's, that's quite important, is you essentially input the b value in the interval a to b, and, and you know where that goes in the integral, and the integral that goes in the second spot. Not always, but, but typically more than a. And if it isn't, of course, you can just flip it around and make it negative, as we saw. Uh, but if you input the second number, right, the higher number, typically, and what's the output of that function going to be? Well, it'll be the area under the curve from A to wherever your B is. Why is this function so important? It will help us motivate the fundamental theorem of calculus. You will see this abbreviation a lot. It does not mean the Federal Trade Commission. It means the fundamental theorem of calculus, which bridges together a lot of the concepts we've studied all throughout the year. Uh, as its name suggests. And for that reason, a, an accumulation function is all but guaranteed to appear in the free response portion of the AP test. So, a uh, very important topic, and let's go ahead and dive right in. Now, uh, this part here is, uh, I want to just be transparent here, I've taken this problem from uh, the Khan Academy, which is an amazing resource, I link to it all the time. Uh, it's a great example, and I'm going to link the actual video that it came from beneath, so that way if you... Uh, don't like my video, you can always look at the, the better version of it because he does an excellent job. So here's a function, g of t. Uh, the, the input value got kind of cut off here, but th that's a t. So g of t. I'm going to introduce a, uh, another function, and I'm going to call this function f. So f is going to take an input value of x, and it's going to output some value. Uh, and that rule, the way that x, f, x becomes f of x, is this rule right here. I want this rule to be defined as the definite integral from negative 3 to x hmm, of g of t with respect to t, g of t dt. So take a minute and really digest what this is telling us. f of x for some number x, you plug in a number x right here. Where does it go in the function? It goes right there. So that might be a little peculiar to you. So let's, let's make use of this with a little example by evaluating the following definite integral. I want us to find this value of the function f. Remember, we do not see a graph of f. We see a graph of a g. Despite that, I want us to find this right here. What is f of 0? If you plug 0 into the function, again, this is our function rule at the very top. If you plug 0 into this function, what do you get? You have negative 3 up to 0 of g of t dt. Okay, well, one interpretation of this thing, as we have seen time and time again, is the area under the curve. So effectively speaking, if we had a if we had a specific function for g of t, which we don't, we don't have a an actual piecewise function that says g of t is this, but we have a graph and and thankfully we can use some geometry here to make sense of it. Uh, so what does this represent? Well, that is this space which I'm going to do here in move, let's say. That's this space. How much stuff is there? That's the sum of infinite rectangles that sum up to make that space. Or we can find the area in more precise ways, which is just using uh, geometry. So this space right here, right, the definite integral 
<clears throat> from negative 3 to 0, and notice that's where our input became uh, of uh, g of t uh, dt. So that area is just going to be an area of a triangle with a base of 3 and a height of 3. So area of a triangle is 1 half base times height. So this is not, you know, strictly speaking, calculus, but this is going to get us the area under the curve, isn't it? Which is one of the interpretations of a definite integral. So 1 half times 3 times 3 will give us uh, 4 and a half, right? So that's f of 0. f of 0 is 4.5. You plug in 0, what do you get? 4.5. Now, 4.5, in a sense, is not on the graph of g, is it? It is on the graph of f, which we do not see at the moment, right? We have to develop f without having f. We have to use g to get f. How do you do that? You use this rule. Okay, fair enough. Let's try a more complicated one. Let's do f of 8. f of 8. So that is the area under the curve, or the accumulation, or the sum of the infinite rectangles, and, and each of those rectangles' size are, are shrinking, uh, from negative 3 up to 8, underneath the curve, bounded by the curve in the x-axis, or t-axis here, of, uh, it is the t-axis of g of t dt. So one thing you may notice here is that the x value that you're provided to is a value of t, right? How did I know to stop at 0 on this? Remember, this is the t-axis. Well, these are my limits of integration from negative 3 to 0 in, in this example here. In this case, it's going to be from negative 3 to 8. So negative 3 is my a, and 8 is my b in that standard interval from a to b of, of the function. There's the area. So, uh, well, this is actually a good opportunity to review our properties of different integrals. What we're looking for is uh, all of this space here. I'll try to color code this the best I can. Let's try this in uh, green, actually. We're trying to find not just that space, but that's part of it, and then also this space right here. Okay, so the definite integral from negative 3 to 8 is what plugging in 8 right here actually makes us do. All right, so according to the properties of definite integrals, which we studied last time, um, we can break an interval apart into smaller sub-intervals. And I'm emphasizing the word interval there just so you don't get confused with integral, because it can get quite confusing. So I'm going to split that up in from negative 3 to 0 of g of t dt. Take a little pit stop and, you know, get some snacks, and then continue onwards from 0 up to, looks like, 6. Oops, I meant to change colors there. Uh, from, negative zero, from 0 up to uh, 6. That's going to be this shape here. G of t, dt. Now think for a minute, what kind of number is that integral going to produce? Area is positive, but that area is sort of in a strange location. Hmm, so think about that. Plus... Second stop, we're almost at our destination. Buckle your seatbelts, put your tray tables up from 6 to 8 of g of t dt. That is going to equal exactly what's written above. Negative 3 to 8 can be negative 3 to 0. You know, get some gas, 0 to 6, get some more snacks, 6 to 8, whoops, and that's negative 3 all the way to 8, just with some pit stops. All right, so we already know what this purple thing is, or move, or whatever I said. Uh, that purple thing is uh, 4 and half, right? Half of 9. Let's talk about this orange thing. This orange thing is also a triangle. Its base is 6 units, right, all the way across. Its height looks like 4 units. So 1 half base times height would be 1 half 6 times 4, better known as 12. So the area is 12, but that area is underneath the x-axis, right? When we sum together these infinite rectangles, our delta x's from 0 up to 6 are positive, tiny but positive, and our y values are f of x's, or sorry, g of t's in this case, I don't mean to interchange those two, but the y values essentially are, uh, are negative, therefore the integral is going to be a negative, so keep that in mind. As we accumulate the purple, right, as we move incrementally from negative 3 up to 0, and then 0 to 6, and then 6 to 8, right, all that 4.5 that we have gathered 
in that first uh, three you know units here in this section right here all of that four and a half that we have gathered all gone in fact more of it's gone because look the orange part is bigger than the purple part so we're going to lose all of that orange so one way to kind of motivate or think about this it's almost like you know in financial terms in the first three days from negative three up to zero uh, for some reason we're starting from the negative time here from negative three up to zero we've accumulated or gathered four and a half units of you know dollars or, or thousands of dollars or whatever but in the next you know six uh, units of time or six months or what have you we have lost all of that and more we have lost 12 units right so let's say in the first three months we had 4.5 uh, million dollars in assets or something from month zero to month six we lost 12 million right that means our net value is not negative 12 we lost 12 from the 4.5 so keep all this in mind as we you be begin to apply this concept. This is just the procedure, but the concept is going to become important, especially when we get to the fundamental theorem of calculus. So that integral integral is the orange part, negative 12. And finally, the green part is also a triangle. Uh, its base is 2. Its height is 4. 1 half base times height, 1 half 2 times 4. I believe that is 4. Right? So those are our incremental parts sum them together and you get negative 3.5 that is the value when you plug 8 in you get negative 3.5 as the output you plug in 0 you get 4.5 you plug in negative 3.5 uh, sorry you plug in 8 you get negative uh, 3.5 now that might be a little peculiar to you how did you plug in 8 which is a bigger number than uh, than 0 right this function g is, is, I know it's decreasing in part of the way, but you plug it in a bigger number and yet you get this negative output. Well, notice, as you go from negative 3 all the way slowly over to 8, right, there's more negative stuff than there is positive stuff. There's more space beneath the x-axis in orange than there is positive space above the x-axis in purple and green. Therefore, the overall accumulation is negative, in this case, 3.5. So, there's a basic introduction to the concept of accumulation functions. What they are, how to use them, and uh, well, mostly what they are. How to use them will, will depend on the concept that we're using, whether it's from physics, whether it's from finance, whether it's from science. As We'll see all those concepts uh, and more in the next couple of weeks. But important part is you're plugging in an x and that x is the one of the limits of integration in your integral of some other function g of t. We do not have a graph of f and yet using calculus and our brains we can figure out what f's values are at certain inputs. Okay, so this is a brief introduction to accumulation functions. We'll see more of that in the next couple of days and weeks. Alright, see you in class.